Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us for this um, conversation. I'm Kim Rattas. I'll be the moderator for this session. And there's uh, so much war and warfare in this region, as you know, we just heard from the Prime Minister himself, that I think we'd be happy not to have to consider another arena of uh, disruption and geopolitical rivalry. But unfortunately, cyber warfare is very much part of the landscape of the region, even if it doesn't get much coverage. And that's going to be the focus of this panel, the growing threat of cyber warfare. And we have to excellent speakers and experts with us. To my left, Tim Maurer is the co-director of the Cyber Policy Initiative. He's a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington. He's the author of the upcoming book out in January, Cyber Mercenaries, The State, Hackers and Power. And to my right, Colin Anderson is an independent researcher based in DC. He works on internet infrastructure, state-sponsored hacking, sanctions, human rights, and authoritarianism. All these things that you, know, you may or may not have heard about, which are really relevant to today's world. And uh, he's also been working on a report with Carnegie on Iran's cyber operations in the region, and that will be coming out next year. Um, I want to start with a basic question to the both of you. Uh, for an audience uh, that is perhaps aware or less aware about the threat of cyber warfare in this region. How much is actually going on when it comes to cyber warfare in, in the region and how does it compare to other uh, regions? Colin. Well, I think that the Middle East tends to be one of the more active places in which uh, especially offline conflicts are playing themselves online. I think that when you look across the, the sorts of cyber operations and incidents that have taken place and have been reported, you see a diversity of motivations. And those motivations play themselves out in terms of uh, foreign policy, interests, regional security priorities, um, but also you know, traditional things like counterterrorism, uh, economic espionage, uh, criminal actions. And I think that just as much as you see a convergence of, of, of uh, foreign policy priorities within the region, uh, you see, similarly see that reflected in the cyber operations that, uh, that are conducted. And, and to be sure, these are both domestic and indigenous regional actors as well as international actors uh, that, are, that are active in, in these sorts of issues. The world, not just the Middle East as well, when you focus on, on these issues, how do you think that the Middle East compares when it comes to cyber warfare in terms of how much activity there is, both at a state and a non-state level, uh, but also in terms of the sophistication of some of those actors? Yeah, maybe let me start by first thanking my colleagues at the center here for making this topic, uh, putting this on the agenda for today. We heard a lot about politics earlier today, but I think it's important to connect the two issues, particularly um, having listened just to the Prime Minister earlier because he made a reference to, to e-government and how every citizen is now a media platform. So I think it's really important to connect the traditional conversations about, pol about politics with what I think is a technological revolution that we are seeing and the implications of this technological revolution on politics. Um, so to your question, in terms of what we've seen in the Middle East, um, just in the last decade alone, the Middle East was in many ways the cradle for some of the offensive cyber operations that we've seen across the board. And just to build on what Colin said, cyber warfare is a, is a, is a catchy title uh, for, for conferences, to fill the room, uh, for engaging with journalists if you want to get published. Um, so cyber warfare is a very catchy title, but a lot of times tends to confuse in terms of what are the actual things that we're talking about. Um, so in terms of what we've seen in the Middle East, we've really seen the full spectrum from activities that are hacking, where somebody's actually hacked a, a computer system and then uh, you can do that to cause various effects from disruption to destruction as we've seen. And we've seen what some people also call cyber warfare in terms of the use of information and the use of the internet for political ends. So um, I think throughout the conversation, um, we'll, we'll touch on all of these aspects and in the Middle East, we've really seen the full spectrum uh, in the last decade. Who are the main actors and how much of it is um, internally domestic um, hacking of activists, of uh, human rights um, uh, organizations? How much of it is outside actors from the region, for example, the United States, targeting countries like Iran? 
I think that it's a, it's a strong mixture of the three. And, and I think that what's, what's interesting is, is that there's a, a kind of, within these operations and within these capabilities, there's a certain, uh, I would say, preference for opacity. Right? You don't necessarily want to expose your operation because that might enable your adversaries to, to protect themselves. And so it's not always clear who is capable of doing what and, and what the strength or capability of, of any particular state is. Certainly we understand through Operation Olympic Games, through Stuxnet, uh, through Flame and these sort of operations that, that occurred against Iran, that Israel is the, the sort of primary and dominant actor when it comes to conducting cyber operations. And the, there is a, a significant order of magnitude uh, difference in capacity between Israel and everyone else. Everyone else. Everyone else. You know, it, in the region. Israel is maybe the first tier even internationally, and you know, second tier, not even. Uh, it, it's really the third tier where other states like Iran and even some non-state actors tend to fall within. Uh, and, and so you, know, you have in the secondary place uh, non-state actors such as, as Hamas and potentially Hezbollah that are also conducting espionage, uh, maybe some disruptive actions at times, but most, mostly what you see is either espionage or the creation of beachheads. And then I, I, I really I appreciated that the, um, the, the point that you embedded there is, is that you do see a number of states that are engaging in, in, in surveillance or targeted intrusions in order to conduct either law enforcement activities such as counter-corruption, counter-terrorism, uh, as, as well as to you know, potentially uh, control political opponents or, or other sorts of opposition within the country. Uh, a number of states, probably nearly every, every country within the region, has been found to be a, a client of vendors like FinFisher or Hacking Team. Uh, while we don't necessarily see a lot of outward activity based off of those states often, that they tend to be internally focused, these are still capabilities that don't necessarily differentiate. And so you, you see a number of states that are sort of waiting in the wings. It's opaque what they're doing. Uh, they're certainly buying. Uh, the capabilities where possible, but they have not necessarily been able to exert themselves in the same way that Iran has towards, uh, uh, towards, for example, the GCC states. Who are the top players in the region other than Israel and Iran when it comes to cyber, cyber warfare? I mean, I'm thinking about the Gulf. Yeah, what I think was really interesting in the, about this space is generally um, how is it different from what we've seen before, right? And to what extent does do cyber tools provide new capabilities to actors? If we look at that, the internet has really had a couple of uh, important implications. The first is what we what we can call the diffusion of reach. That geography all of a sudden plays a much uh, lesser role. This is particularly important when you look at it from a great powers perspective, Russia, China, the U.S. Right? That all of a sudden distances matter much less, um, which in the Middle East is a little less relevant because geography has always been particularly compressed when it comes to the politics involved. But the other interesting aspect is the low barriers to entry. The fact that even if you're a non-state actor and you are somewhat sophisticated in terms of expertise, knowledge, and you know how to hack, then you have a, fair, uh, then you have a pretty good capability at your hand that previously, if we we're talking about conventional weaponry, would cost a lot of money. So what is really interesting about the evolution of um, cyber tools and the capability to hack with, combined with this diffusion of reach is that non-state actors now have capabilities they simply didn't have before in terms of reaching certain targets that were far beyond their reach or otherwise they would have to be physically close to the target in order to carry out their effect. So if we're talking about sabotage uh, or other means. So in terms of how this relates to the, the, the actors in the region, it's really interesting to look at some of the early incidents tied to hacking because some of those were tied to states and you have had very few, maybe a handful, that for the last 20 years have had these capabilities. So this is the US, uh, Russia, uh, Israel, but even with China, it, it gets maybe the last 10 years. And then many of the other cyber incidents that date back 20 or 30 years are non-state actors, criminal ac hackers who've targeted banks, for example, or who were political hacktivists, right? Even here in the region, you have politically motivated hackers who've been active for quite some time. And only in the last, I would say, essentially since Stuxnet became publicly known in 2010, 
that the rest of the international community and states have kind of woken up to what is possible through these new technological means. And the latest number that we have, uh, according to, to James Clapper, who testified, I think, uh, about a year ago, there are now 30 plus countries that are developing offensive cyber capabilities. So if you think that what we've seen in the last 10 years is already kind of, oh, uh, a lot has happened, <laughs> just wait for the next 10 years when the number of actors are proliferating at a race that, at, a, at a speed we haven't seen in, in the past. And, and Stuxnet, which you refer to, of course, for those who don't know, was the quite major uh, operation, cyber uh, operation sabotage led by the US and Israel, correct? Uh, to sabotage the Iranian nuclear uh, program. Colin, you wanted to say something. And this, this might be a, as much a question for Tim, um, but what I think is also interesting is I, I do think that there are changes in, in dynamics about how you, uh, how you start to pursue or build capacity when it comes to cyber operations that is different from uh, traditional military capacity. And so I wonder for GCC states, for example, which have a history of, for example, buying from you know, American defense companies and, and, and these sorts of uh, uh, um, sort of military contractors, I don't know if you necessarily see these contractors selling uh, cyber capabilities in the same way that they have, uh, for example, fighter jets or missile defense programs. And so I wonder if, to a certain extent, what you're also seeing is, is a, a clash of cultures a clash of a sort of uh, defense industry uh, patterns or tactics or, you know, who do you, if, if you're Saudi Arabia, who do you go and, and you buy from? Uh, because it seems like mostly the, the states that have been able to pursue this are, are countries that have sort of, for lack of a better term, gotten their act together and started to foster domestic educational programs, started to re recruit domestic hackers, started to build a, a sort of indigenous capacity and not necessarily... Uh, exactly, exactly. The Iranians have done this, uh, you know, since at least 2007 or 2008. And they had the pool of talent, they had a, a defacement community, vandalists, that they could start to, to pull from, and that's how they seem to build their capacity. I don't know if you're Saudi Arabia or if you're the Emirates, uh, that it's necessarily quite as easy if you're not willing to sort of put in the time or have the base uh, to recruit from. So do you have the answer to that question? Who is Saudi Arabia going to, to fend off, to perhaps um, conduct cyber warfare against um, Iran, uh, but also to fend off attacks? Because they have been subjected to attacks like Shamoon, which uh, was an attack against the private sector and government, and, and government ministries. So I don't have the specific answer to the question because I don't have access to the procurement contracts. Um, but let me just share, I think, some of the insights that also fed in, into the book in terms of proxy relationships. Because to, to, to Colin's point, I think what we've seen is you have this emergence of uh, capabilities outside of government, non-state actors, be it hacktivists, but also private companies, right? You have the traditional uh, security contractors who've moved in this space. And how countries build up their capabilities differs from country to country and partly depending on the political culture. Um, so if we look at the indictment that the US government unsealed last year of the Iranian hackers, um, and, and Colin will, uh, I think, can shed more details about that, it suggests that there is a relationship that mirrors the relationships we've seen in the past between, for example, Tehran and how it uses non-state actors. So I think there is a... State actors. The, the use of non-state actors for political slash military purposes and, and leveraging that to project power. Um, and, and those relationships seem to be on a looser kind of leash than the, the relationships that, for example, the US has with cybersecurity companies, where there's a specific contract, they're on a much tighter control and tighter leash, and therefore subject, as part of the broader political game, uh, easier to rein in. So I think one of the key questions is, how tight is the relationship between the government and the actor that is used to help build the capability uh, because it relates to questions of escalation control and how they could be controlled in, as part of a broader conflict. Because when, you're, when you use non-state actors uh, to conduct your cyber warfare, you have plausible deniability. So we should assume that Gulf countries aren't exactly hiring uh, big contractors to conduct some of that, that warfare. Is that, is that fair? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily plausible deniability as it is, uh, as it is whether or not, uh, for example, the United States is even allowing for uh, American companies to play a role. We at least know that Qatar had tried to purchase some offensive uh, capacity from 
uh, from a security contractor and had a, a, a license denied. I think that there's a real concern around proliferation that has maybe constrained the willingness of, of European and American uh, export control agencies or, or intelligence agencies to, to allow the proliferation of, of these tools and you know, to widen the number of, of, of states that are involved in this. And we've already seen things like uh, the Wassenaar arrangement, which is, a, it is in fact a dual use arms control regime uh, put into place uh, export restrictions or export controls around these sorts of items. And so I think that you know, given that, that states don't necessarily know what proliferation means, that there's maybe been a, a caution allow, uh, about letting their contractors be involved with that. If I can briefly jump in because I think it's helpful. Uh, I apologize for getting a little technical, but I think it's really important for the discussions about politics and policy because when we use the term cyber weapon or offensive tool, this really ranges from law enforcement needs and gaining access to a system for a criminal investigation to the type of code, which is still software, that could cause a destructive effect and you have actual physical damage that occurs. So when we use the term offensive uh, capability, we cover this broad spectrum because from a technical perspective, they relate to you need to gain access to a system to then do what you're trying to do, which might be just stealing data, uh, either for a law enforcement purpose or for an intelligence activity, or also to violate human rights if you're actually doing this to steal data without the consent of the person involved who's not a suspect of criminal activity. And you need to gain access to a critical infrastructure system, uh, to a, a water facility and a bank, but what you do once in the system and whether you shut off the system or you, tr you try to make it explode, that's where what we call payload, that is actually the responsible part of the code that triggers the effect, that's what differs. Um, but we use the term offensive capability really across the board, um, and I think it's, some, it's important to, to distinguish when we use the term cyber weaponry that it's not necessarily something that describes something that blows up and that could kill people, but is also tightly related to intelligence activities. And there are different purposes um, to this cyber warfare. I mean, some of it is espionage, some of it is um, uh, sabotage, some of it is disinformation. You know, we saw. Um, U.S. intelligence in, in July concluded that the hacking of a Qatari news website was conducted, was, was done by, engineered by the UAE to plant false um, news reports that sparked a Gulf crisis. There's a lot of that going on. We saw the hacking of the emails of the UAE ambassador um, in, 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 in Washington. Do these, do this, does this cyber warfare mirror the, the geopolitics of, of the region? Absolutely, and and I think that you see it. Uh, I, I think you see it repeatedly play out. For example, what you saw at the start of this year was another round in in what is called the the Shamun attacks, which are uh, which appear to be Iranians uh, engaging in destructive actions against Saudi companies uh, in order to potentially coerce the uh, coerce Saudi in its regional conflicts. And so I think that you you see increasingly that. Uh, for, for reasons that, that Tim had mentioned, uh, for example, you know, geographic diffusion, that there are lower barriers that allow uh, for a lot more sort of asymm asymmetric strategies uh, of coercion and retaliation. I, I think that you do see these challenges uh, play themselves out very quickly in, in cyber operations and cyberspace. How much does, um, you know, in, in, in the, when you look at the, the region and how the different actors are, are playing, um, how much does it mirror, in, in your view, the, geo, the geopolitics? And who is ahead? I think what we've seen in the Middle East, I think, is the best example, simply because the activity has been taking place for so long that it's actually a really interesting case study to see how it's connected to the broader political discussions, right? If we look at the uh, Operation Olympic Games, which was the, the name for Stuxnet, you had the targeted sabotage of the Iranian nuclear facility, and then shortly, a few years thereafter, you had the Shamoon malware hitting Saudi uh, Aramco and disrupting the business operation of the Saudi oil company. While it didn't necessarily disrupt the production of oil per se, so many hard drives of Saudi Aramco had been wiped and were unusable that the company went around the world to all of the producers of hard drives 
asking them and offering additional money to essentially jump the queue of all of the other customers who wanted hard drives because they needed them so badly that it temporarily increased the hard drives of all of the customers because of the effect of that single operation that wiped the hard drives of Saudi Aramco, a single company. Um, and then you had the RAS gas attack and, and s several other incidents that when they hit the news, they made a splash as a new single incident. And it took us some time to, uh, at least in the pub public domain, to connect the dots and to see these incidents tied to the broader political discussions around the Iranian nuclear program. And then also if you look at some of the activity of Iranian hackers, for example, the um, the indictment that I mentioned earlier was about Iranian hackers who targeted some of the world's largest financial institutions who were headquartered in New York and tried to disrupt their business operations. And this was taking place alongside the negotiations for uh, the GCPOA and there is an interesting correlation between this activity that was happening. So it tail tapers off when the deal is reached. Exactly. Um, and, and we saw s something similar happen, not in, this, in the specific context of this region, but for example, the best example we have to date that an international agreement can actually change the calculus and behavior is the agreement between President Obama and the Chinese President Xi in September 2015 when the Chinese President agreed to language where they agreed not to conduct economic espionage. And shortly after this bilateral agreement, both the intelligence community as well as threat intelligence analysts at private companies noticed a reduction in the malicious activity as a result of this political agreement. So in spite of the discussions around the attribution problem and that it's hard to track back activity, we do have examples that suggest political agreements can nevertheless, can nevertheless produce a change in behavior in spite of that challenge. So to, uh, to, to extend Tim's point, I think what is interesting is, is that what you have seen is an absence of necessarily certain states fully grasping the, the threat or the potential in, in cyberspace. What you've seen is that the, the capabilities in terms of offense and defense have not necessarily uh, uh, diffused uh, evenly across the region or, or not even in a way that necessarily tracks with defense spending. And so what you, you've seen is also this, the calculus of opportunity and intent really seems to drive some of this behavior. And so in the case of, of the Shemun attacks against Saudi Aramco, this was clearly retaliation for something that the United States has done. The United States, US government, US industry, having spent hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars might not be within the direct retaliatory uh, sort of uh, capacity of Iranian actors. There's a certain boundary in which they seem to be able to operate. They don't seem to be able to necessarily for example, compromise highly secured or compartmentalized or, 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 or hardened systems. And so they, they, they have to work within sort of the boundaries of what they can potentially get into or, or, or do. The same thing exists between Iran and Israel. Israel, uh, having a strong domestic uh, technology sector, has really mobilized and coordinated uh, around responding to cyber threats. And so what you see is, is that there's sort of a strong defensive capacity with a lot of Iran's uh, potential adversaries, but not all of them and potentially not their adversaries' allies. And so what you see is, is sort of by proxy punitive behavior towards, towards allies. And I think this again reflects uh, proxy behavior with respect to terrorism, right? If the US does something with respect to Jerusalem, that there might be a threat of, for example, uh, you know, attacks against uh, uh, Americans within Iraq. I think similarly that plays out with cyberspace. So what you see is potentially that if there is conflict between Israel and Iran or Israel and the United States, the, the punishment and the retaliation is not against those, it's against the Saudis because the Saudis haven't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, made substantial improvements to their defensive game. I'm, I'm trying not to be uh, terribly malign or, 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 or denigrate Saudi. Um, but there, it's very clear. have not invested properly in defense mechanisms when it comes to cyber warfare. No, um, I think that only in the past two years. I think that what you saw was after Shemun, there was really an attempt to buy capacity. And that only gets you so far. What you also need is you need domestic coordination. You need to have computer emergency response teams. You need to have really an internal culture of responsibility around cybersecurity and defense. The, in, that's not just a thing that you can throw money at. 
And so what I think that you had was you, you're seeing this transition. It is getting better, but there is still an ample amount of opportunity. There's a lot of companies with a lot of money, uh, but also a lot of exposure. And, and while you have not necessarily seen something like Saudi Aramco being crippled to the effect that, that Tim so well described, uh, but you have seen things like the Shamun 2 campaigns over the course of November 2016 to January 2017, where what you saw was the Iranians were just hammering away at kind of these small businesses or small government agencies. Not so small. In fact, sometimes they were, uh, you know, seemingly aviation firms, aviation authorities. And so what they could do is they could just cause destructive attacks at, the, at this middle tier in order to sort of wage a campaign of attrition. And again, it's so well aligns with sort of traditional Iranian military po policy and, and asymmetric strategy. And we just, yeah, go ahead. Um, because Colin just made a really important point about the defensive aspect of it, right? But even if you, at the, at, if you look at the US, uh, we are clearly not very well protected. Um, we had uh, an election that was tampered with. We had the DNZ that was hacked. We had the White House that's been hacked. We had uh, Sony that's been hacked. So the challenge is many countries right now are still struggling with that. And I'd be curious in the room, um, how many of you, just a quick show of hands, are using two-factor authentication? So if you, if you check your email, how many of you have to plug in a second code for that? How many of you know what two-factor authentication is? No, it's a serious question. A lot of people don't know. Well, if, if I, I know you're all very so, so busy. So on Google <laughs> and, and make sure you have two-step two authentication. I, I was about to say, if, um, if there's one thing that I'd like you to take away from this panel uh, is make 10 minute, take 10 minutes of your time uh, by the end of the day and, and just look it up because this is not only with regard to your email accounts, um, but also your bank accounts and to protect them. To, to connect it to a political example, in 2013, a hacktivist group called the Syrian Electronic Army gained access to the Twitter account of the Associated Press and placed a tweet from the Twitter account of the Associated Press saying that there had been an attack on the White House, that President Obama had been wounded, and it cost a I think the stock market crashed by, two, by 300 points, thankfully only temporarily, because the Associated Press realized what had happened and issued a separate statement issuing that there had not been an attack on the White House, that it was completely fabricated and it was essentially fake news. And the reason why the Syrian Electronic Army was able to gain access to the account is, uh, as far as I know, because the Associated Press didn't use two-factor authentication for its Twitter uh, account and for its uh, accounts. So um, I, I'm just encourage you to take a look at this before the end. Yeah, so, so we often think of cyber warfare as this sort of very sophisticated thing, but it can also be done with very, you know, low key, you know, low technology um, tools. And, and I, I want to talk very briefly before we move on to the future and then take some questions from um, the audience. I want to talk about the non-state actors like Hamas and Hezbollah that you just mentioned. What, what, what are they up to? Well, the easier question, or maybe the more open answer is that what you've seen is at least Hezbollah has conducted uh, what appears to be espionage operations. However, there isn't necessarily a, a great deal of public proof of the, anything happening after 2015. On the other hand, Hamas is incredibly active, um, or, or rather uh, actors that seem to be linked to Hamas and, and, tru uh, and sort of aligned with the policy and interest of, of Hamas. And so what you see is, uh, you know, covered in a number of campaigns that have different technical terms within the cybersecurity industry, a repeated pattern of, of espionage against the political adversaries of Hamas. And again, it looks like uh, largely to be uh, espionage in uh, interest, but you see Hamas engaging in uh, espionage against, against Fatah, against Saudi Arabia, against, against Israel. And what's, what that really, I think, speaks well to uh, Tim's point is, is that even a non-state actor, even a, you know, a, a, a very isolated region, you need people that are just dedicated, who have a little bit of technical expertise, who kind of maybe know how to speak the language, know how to socially manipulate people, uh, you know, how, know how to take off-the-shelf off the toolkits that are publicly available, free, or be, can be pirated. And on that basis, you can really start to build up kind of the capacity, and you learn over t time. 
And, and you know, these, these Gaza-based hackers seem to have been doing it for several years now, and they've gotten better. And you'll see, you know, a couple of months ago, there was a disclosure of Android-targeted malware seemed to be linked with these groups. A lot of the victims seem to be uh, uh, either Palestinian activists, uh, maybe potential members of, of the Fatah party. Uh, so, so they get better. And they seem to be rewarded by that in, in, in certain respects. And it takes very little. But it's low cost. It's extremely low cost. Yeah. Um, Tim, you mentioned several times now the Shamoon attack against Aramco. You made a reference to the elections in the US with the hacking of the DNC. You know, obviously, Russia is a factor um, in a lot of this cyber warfare as well. But when it comes to the public and, and private sector, like Com companies like Aramco or ministries, government ministries in, in Saudi Arabia, or since you know the Lebanese Prime Minister um, said you know we should move to e to e government, you know should should we actually be saying no 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 let's not let's not do that because it's safer to preserve our you know paper um, instead of preserving our trying to protect our our e government. Um, you know what what are the you know what are the risks? What are the um, the, you know, what is the level of awareness and preparedness you think in, in the region for some of the smaller countries that could be targets as well? Um, I think the, the Prime Minister's reference to e-government is, is a particularly good case study because it shows that on the one hand, uh, new technology provides um, unprecedented benefits, right? Using that as a tool to address uh, uh, corruption and you have similar discussions when it comes to blockchain technologies and distributed ledgers that they provide a new level of transparency and make it much easier, uh, much harder, for example, to use it as a tool of corruption. Um, at the same time, if you use such a system, it'll also be, make it a target to try to tamper with it, right? Um, so where it, there will be certain sensitive systems where it makes sense to just use paper. We have in the US now a discussion whether the voting system and process should be entirely paper-based. Most European countries, for example, never switch to e-voting and to never use, uh, never use electronic voting systems. In the US, there's now an active discussion whether that, uh, that should occur. So I think the challenge that, we've, that we face is that while the benefits just accrue in terms of the economic benefits, everybody's moving uh, more and more digital, including critical infrastructure, right? So systems, uh, dams, water facilities that were not connected to the internet um, uh, um, 10 years ago are more and more connecting, but also medical devices, right? Like think of a pacemaker who weren't connected to the internet even five or, or six years ago, but now there's an advantage of them being, having a connection so you can make adjustments if it's medically necessary. But at the same time, all of a sudden you could hack a pacemaker, right? So um, there are certain systems where you cannot create an air gap and separate the connection. Um, uh, and then the question is, how can you reduce the risk and manage it? And that's a risk calculus where we have risk frameworks to think about, and especially private sector companies are, are very attuned to that. It's much more a question of getting this to for CEOs and to make this a C-suite level discussion so that you have the CEOs pay attention to it, that you have the prime minister pay attention to it, as he clearly does here. Um, so it's not just an afterthought. Um, Colin, it, going back to the, the, the big picture of the region and um, the, the, geopolitic, the geopolitics of it, what do you think we should expect in the next year in terms of you know, who is getting ready to launch the next assault or uh, you know, in cyberspace? Well, I, I don't think that you're going to see a change in defensive capacity overnight that leads to a, an overall change in sort of exposure and opportunity. Uh, these things take time. I think what we have seen is that states that go on the offensive seem to be re rewarded. And my concern is, is that you know, uh, some of the work that we had done in the past is looking at the involvement of hackers for higher operations within, within the Middle East region. It would appear in certain cases that, for example, a number of Gulf states may have, uh, or rather that hackers for hire had pursued interests that aligned with Gulf, Gulf states. And I think that given that states are getting attacked, and they're not able to defend it themselves, that you might see a, a, a stronger pursuit for retaliatory capacity. And when these things are effective within political contexts, as they seem to have been in the GCC conflict, 
that this just rewards and incentivizes other states to pursue this. And so what you might start to see is, is that countries that have had the capacity or the interest either for domestic targeting or for smaller operations will continue to pursue this because it's easier to pursue offense rather than defense. And so I would be concerned that what you're going to see is a lot more proliferation, a lot more interest, a lot more involvement, and that that interest is not going to necessarily uh, kind of uh, ma be matched by a rate of uh, improvements in, in overall security, in stability, uh, and, and in defense. Because I, I also, you know, given that we've clearly established that these sorts of incidents are, clear, are linked with regional security and regional stability, uh, unless there's a promise of greater regional stability over the next year, uh, there won't be a, a, a promise of, of greater stability in cyberspace. And it certainly doesn't look like the tensions are, are abating in the region. If anything, they're, they're getting um, worse for now. But I'll, I'll give uh, my, I, I'll turn to you for my last question before we take um, questions from, from the audience. You sort of alluded to, to, to this in your last answer about the dangers of cyber warfare and cyber operations for you know, civilian population. This isn't just state to state. Uh, but in a region where we have seen so much um, war, where countries are being bombed to smithereens, should, be, should we be wishing that all warfare moves to the cyber era, cyber arena? I think it's a great question, and the, it points to the real question of what is new about this, right? What is new about cyber tools compared to other uh, conventional means? Proxies aren't new. You in this region know more about proxies than I think any, anywhere else. Um, the diffusion of reach is not new in this region where geography really doesn't matter. What is new is that you could have a new trigger of a political crisis that we saw with this fake information. Um, so there might, it might be a new trigger for a political crisis or a war. Uh, what is new is that you could have more of an accidental effect. The WannaCry malware that crippled hospitals in the United Kingdom because somebody used malware at, at, for something that they didn't intend, but it was crippling hospitals, could have an effect that we did, nobody anticipated. And then there is a point that you were just referring to is, when we look at the operation targeting the Iranian nuclear facility, according to the New York Times journalist David Sanger, part of the reason why the US government and the Israeli government chose to launch the cyber attack was as an alternative to conducting another conventional war. So there is part of an argument or a line of thought that argues we need to use hacking because it might help prevent people from dying. That argument only works, though, if you actually follow all of the other related principles of you want to minimize the Geneva Conventions, you want to minimize civilian harm, you have lawyers that actually make sure that you don't cross a certain boundary, that the way you write the code makes sure that it's not going to be something like WannaCry that targets a lot of innocent civilians and third parties. Um, and you need to be, to, to have the intent. And I would argue, looking at the proliferation of activities, I'm less optimistic um, that the benefits of that line of thought will really pay off compared to who might pursue this and cause much greater harm than otherwise. Great, well, uh, lots to think about. Um, and we're ready for questions from the audience. If you could uh, raise your hand, introduce yourself, and uh, keep it short. We've got two here in the front. Oops. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Kraidiyi, and I'm a neurologist, medical doctor. I'd like to thank you for a remarkable and very interesting uh, presentation. My question is as follows. It's really on the technology of, uh, uh, of, the, of the use of uh, medicine in these uh, applications. I mean, we use it extensively now uh, from uh, ICUs, from the heart, like you mentioned, and other issues. Uh, I'm, in addition to being a neurologist, I'm a legal expert. Assume I have one of my patients die because of a hacking of his pacemaker. Would, could that be identified on the, on the on the techno from the technological aspect? Yes and, yes and no. So what you're uh, partly referring to is the attribution challenge and whether you can trace back uh, a specific type of hack. Um, there are technical indications that you can uh, analyze in terms of what code was used to carry out the specific attack. Um, and that will only leave uh, limited indications of who might be the political actor or the other actor behind it. That's when you need much more human intelligence and you need to use other sources to really identify who might be behind that specific type of attack. 
Um, I think the medical industry and the medical field is really interesting because one of the challenges we face in this space that is new is conventionally, if you're a hospital and you have a Red Cross on you, and under the laws of war, militaries know you don't target the hospital, right? We have a clear set of, uh, of norms around that. The problem is the same systems that hospitals use technically the same software are being used also by militaries around the world. So if you write a software that's supposed to target a specific te technical system and you don't write it in a way that makes sure it's only that system that you want to target, you might, you might be infecting the system of a hospital, which as we saw with WannaCry in the UK. And you, also have, you have a problem of distinguishing intent as well. In this case, was the intent, you know, uh, unlike Fortunately and unfortunately, unlike in a conventional sense, within cyber, uh, within cyberspace, within cyber warfare, you have seen a, a greater propensity to target hospitals. You have seen a number of cases in which ho hospitals have been targeted. Most recently, what I, I've seen is that, for example, uh, the actors that seem to be linked to Hamas have targeted Israeli hospitals. You know, what is the intention of that? Uh, is that is the intention of it espionage to understand who's going into Israeli hospitals for whatever purpose, or is it in order to conduct an attack? Is it signaling? Does somebody want to say I could uh, interfere with this hospital's operations? I could make this destructive, uh, and and irrespective of what is the intent, there could be potential outcomes if something happens. Uh, it, it is quite easy to fail and to create catastrophic effects, just like with WannaCry. Uh, also, to an extent, Stuxnet. Stuxnet was never supposed to be turned out to the world. And so if something becomes destructive and causes human harm, you also have a, an unclear expression of what the purpose of that intrusion was in the first place. And from a policy response standpoint, that um, as well as, as being a medical doctor, <laughs> Uh, that's concerning and not immediately clear and potentially difficult to address. Yes, uh, my name is Ahmed Tamsa, I'm a retired Army General. I belong to the Papers and Pen Age and I'm so very glad about it. Uh, what my question is, there is now a conflict between, we know there was a crisis between North Korea and the United States. Do you think that there's the the possibility of somebody, a hacker as you call him, and could come in between and initiate a nuclear war. My second question is, are we entering the era of uh, Terminator, Schwarzenegger, Rise of the Machines? Thank you. Tim, and the first. So, um, first of all, Arnold Schwarzenegger then became governor of California, so he had a tech background, so that's good. Um, uh, I think North Korea is really, really interesting because when you look at the North Korean conflict uh, and the tension with the US, the incident that actually globalized this tension from the reg always regional Asia Pacific Forum wasn't the current discussion about the ICBMs and the nuclear weapon. It was the Sony attack and the North Korean hackers that targeted Sony that all of a sudden had the President of the United States go in front of public television cameras and, and, and accuse North Korea of having targeted this company in the United States. Um, so hacking has, has been part of this discussion. The New York Times published a, a, an article a while ago that suggests that similar act, actions taken uh, targeting Iranian nuclear facilities have been taken targeting North Korea's weapons program. Um, but as we've also seen in the past is a learning effect that uh, as, as more and more cyber incidents become known and how they've been conducted, uh, actors learn how to better defend themselves against it. And similar to what we saw with Iran, at the end of the day, cyber means are part of a broader political game. So there, I think, uh, the initial overly optimistic uh, fears or uh, thoughts that it ha would have uh, strategic implications with regard to countries, I think it's much more of a tactical tool um, but North Korea is a really interesting example. Um, just one more comment. North Korea has also been accused of having been behind a lot of the recent uh, cyber haste targeting financial institutions. The Bangladeshi Central Bank that lost $89 million because apparently North Korean hackers uh, hacked the bank and were trying to steal all of this money. Um, so the counterfeit currency activities that we've seen in the past seems to now go into cyber. 
So I, w I would only extend that to say, you know, specific, there, it, there's the colloquial term of false flag is potentially overused. But what you're, what you're referring to is essentially what if a third party actor conducts a false flag operation in order to uh, stir up some sort of controversy. And we have seen this and, uh, repeatedly ar already. We've seen third parties that have you know, engaged in destructive or disruptive actions, uh, attested to being somebody else or claimed to being something else. And this shows that this anonymity and this proxy type of uh, strategy that cyberspace affords is a, is a dual-edged sword um, because it could equally be misused. So an example is, is th that a French TV station had its systems disrupted by uh, an, an actor that called themselves the Cyber Caliphate, claimed to be re related to ISIS. Uh, it's, later, it's believed that that was linked with, uh, with a Russian group. Uh, similarly, we had in 2015, the Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs had a great deal of uh, amount of confidential information given over to WikiLeaks. Uh, there is still kind of, uh, uh, this was all done in the name of what was called, what the people called themselves, the Yemeni Cyber Army, uh, which had never existed before and is quite an impressive first feat to, to start from. Uh, now, this was first, the, the files were actually first given to Farce News, uh, were kind of previewed through Farce News, which would imply that maybe it was Iran. Um, but at the same time, you know, cybersecurity experts believe that some of it looks like it might have been Russia. And so you had a situation in which somebody who claimed to be in Yemen uh, engaged in a, in a, in a disruptive and, and highly, you know, disruptive uh, a breach of, of a governmental institution and it was clear that it was not Yemen. It was clear to, it, was, it was a third party that potentially had interest in, in enlarging that split. Now, whether a third party is able uh, to conduct a sophisticated or destructive enough action to cause you know, actual conflict between US and, 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 and North Korea is unclear, but certainly you have a, a long history of this sort of manipulation and, and you know, shadowy operations and false flag attacks. We have time for just a few more questions. I'm going to collect a few. There's one in the front here. There's uh, a lady in the back as well raising her hand. We'll get the microphone to you in just uh, a minute. If you could introduce yourself, keep the question Hello. brief. Muhammad Alamuddin. Uh, always in the context of confrontation, uh, is there a probability that a cyber attack would lead to a conventional war, given the factor of uh, plausible deniability, number one? Number two? how vulnerable cyber defense systems of Arab countries vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis cyber attacks of Israel. Okay, great. A question in, all the way in the back. Thanks both very much. Um, I'm Anna Simpson. I'm an independent futures advisor and creator of the Future Center. Um, I'm interested in hearing more about the opportunities you see in cyber tools for governance and peace building and um, any actions that you'd recommend for harnessing these possibilities. Great, and then um, we'll take one more um, from Gilbert right here on the, um, on this side of, of the room and that will give you some time to think about um, the answers. <coughs> Gilbert, if you could Raise your hand so the mic can, can get to you. But we can... Sure. Uh, Gilbert Domit. But maybe I missed this, so can you give us a map of wh wh what are the central uh, control, the strongest countries in controlling the cybersecurity? <laughs> and if you said that the power balance will not shift soon, so would you recommend from a security perspective to use very traditional archaic security strategies, measures, underground, locally made, so to counter the, the incapacity to match the foreign capacity internationally in terms of security. Um, Colin, do you want to take that last one first? Uh, yeah, I can maybe take part of the first and the second. I think that with respect to Israel, what you see is a, an order of magnitude difference in, in the level of sophistication that, uh, that they can conduct. If you look at something like Operation Olympic Games, the reactor that they were targeting was disconnected from the internet. And so that involved potentially using human assets in order to gain access to those disconnected systems. 
And when those ha human assets might have been basically cut off or, or exposed, what Israel and the United States began to do uh, was use uh, previously un, uh, unknown exploits, incredibly sophisticated uh, uh, ex exploits in order to infect computers that might incidentally be plugged into that system. And in order to do this, you had uh, you know, a lab that was set up using uh, centrifuges that were captured from Libya. So when you start to look at it, you start to see the amount of resources that Israel was able to conjure up was able, able to coordinate the amount of expertise, people looking for these vulnerabilities, the computational power to, to exploit them, it's just, it's, it's in the you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars for one operation. And if you have an adversary that is able to go through that level of preparation and, and perform such a sophisticated operation, to be a defender, you're just, you're, you're not in a good position. And, and while, you have not necessarily seen, with respect to Arab countries, a demonstrative example in the past decade. I think that the most recent example was, uh, was when Israel conducted a, a, uh, a targeted attack against a potential nuclear site in Syria. You did see a disruption of its radar systems in advance of that attack. Uh, this, this really speaks to an enormous amount of capacity and a willingness to use that capacity and really a, 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 a failure to be able to protect it against such a, such a sophisticated actor. So I, I, I just, it's, it's just, it's, it's difficult to explain how much of a distance there is between the defense and the offense between, between the two. And I think that that maybe also kind of covers some of the power centers as well. Uh, I don't think that you've seen within the region really a development of, of cybersecurity capacity. I think you've seen initiatives within especially the, uh, the Emirates to be able to build up and, and foster an industry, uh, particularly around security, defensive security, not necessarily offensive. And then you have seen potentially a from foreign companies, uh, especially American companies, some European uh, cybersecurity companies to procure some of that, but there's still just such a, 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 a sort of a um, a distance and a difference and, and, a, and a failure to, to diffuse these defensive capabilities. And Tim, on um, cyber warfare leading to conventional war and, and the question we just had from the back. Yeah, uh, and I know we stand between you and lunch, so I'll be quick. Um, can this be a trigger for war? Uh, I think, yeah, that's a real chance. Think of 1914 where we had the assassination of the Serbian uh, do great and that led, led to an escalation. So I think there could be triggers that are the result of a hack. Uh, the interesting question here is, what can a hack substitute conventional means for, where we know what will happen? And the more interesting question is, what happens if a hack is used for something that couldn't be done before? So if you take out the financial system of a country, will that lead to war? Because nobody's gonna die, right? But you have significant economic pain. So will a country consider that to be sufficient reason to actually escalate to a war? I think that's a really interesting question. And I do uh, the peace building question. Um, there are lots of things to set here. The main point I want to make is the fact, I think the negotiators and the people involved in mediation of these political conflicts need to be hypersensitive about their communication to be very, very secure and to use two-factor authentication and encryption and everything else because there are so many actors in these highly complex negotiations environments who have an incentive to gain access to that information and to potentially leak it to undermine a pot potential outcome uh, that is, didn't necessarily exist to the same degree before, and there's a lack of awareness, I think, among a lot of the people involved um, uh, about that. Just to, maybe as an end note, you know, to that specific point, uh, this re all relies on you know, offline regional security. And so fundamentally, you're not solving anything through just uh, pursuing cybersecurity approaches because the catalyst for this is regional insecurity. We see this with the Iran deal. It changed the way in which uh, disruptive cyber operations occurred within the regions. You have less attacks. Uh, you have more espionage, but you have less disruptive attacks. And so these sorts of issues have to be taken within the context of the political affairs of, of the region.
Um, I think you have raised the awareness of, of the audience about these, uh, these issues, cyber, cyber warfare, defense, two-factor authentication. I think everybody's going to uh, either Google it or make sure that they, that they have it. Uh, Tim Maurer and Colin Anderson, thank you very much for your insights, for a really informative conversation. Thank you all uh, for being here. Lunch is served, and the next session is at 3.15, or at 2.15.